The racing genre is in a fantastic state. Xbox fans are enjoying two blockbuster Forza franchises, Gran Turismo Sport has had phenomenal post-launch support, and Formula One is on a hot streak of incredibly realistic video game adaptations. Even casual racing fans have three fantastic kart games to choose from, with Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, Team Sonic Racing, and Crash Team Racing Nitro Fueled. It's a great time to be a racing game. But not for Electronic Arts and their woebegotten racing franchise. Need for Speed Heat releases on November 8th. It'll be the 24th game in a series that started way back in 1994. A series with plenty of good games that were met with commercial and critical success. But the last two releases, Need for Speed and Need for Speed Payback, are failed games. And Need for Speed Heat looks to continue that tradition. The question is, what are they doing wrong? To find an answer, we have to talk about the two big components of any video game. Aesthetics and mechanics. Or, in simpler terms, how a game looks and how it feels. For racing games, the look and feel of a game are often intertwined. Hardcore sim racers like iRacing or Assetto Corsa strive for absolute realism both in how the cars look and handle. They try to emulate the changing grip of dynamic tire wear and subtle handling cues of suspension under load, all while modeling every knob, switch, and lever of the car's interior. Reality becomes the sole inspiration for both aesthetics and mechanics. Arcade racers are on the opposite end of the spectrum. Think Wipeout, Crazy Taxi, or Onrush. Designers of these games chose to ignore reality in favor of over-the-top art styles and hyperbolic gameplay. Who needs realism when you can rocket boost off a ramp and soar into first place? But it's really a false dichotomy between arcade and sim racing, as plenty of games skillfully blend the two. Forza Horizon features a massive roster of real-life cars that you can drive through all sorts of wild fauna. And Wreckfest lets you smash and bash your opponents within a surprisingly robust handling system. The point I'm trying to make in describing this relationship between aesthetics and mechanics is that it exists, and it's important. A good video game recognizes that the final product must be a singular, cohesive piece of entertainment. All of the design choices and gameplay systems should blend into one another, such that they become both indistinguishable and inseparable. Which brings us back to Need for Speed. More specifically, the 2015 soft reboot called Need for Speed. That's right, the one that has FMV cutscenes and the average score of 65 on Open Critic. One of the things about this game is that everybody in it looks at you like they are down to do it. Look at him. <laughs> He's like, he is into it. This game is a puzzling melange of game design choices. On the aesthetics front, the game replicates the late night street racing scene that is emblematic of youth car culture. But they do so with cringy characters and excessive branding. And the actual gameplay is lacking. AI that likes to cheat, limited control choices, and forced online elements. It's a game that wants to be about the grassroots racing scene, but also betrays it. I think this game's failure boils down to a lack of cohesive vision. Aesthetics is more than just a theme or setting. It has to be supported with compelling writing and enthralling gameplay. In a game that's all about building and tuning and driving your own car, you want to give as much control to the player as possible. Forcing them to watch glorified product placement or race against a rubber band enemy feels wrong. Need for Speed 2015 does exactly that. It asks the player to be a renegade street racer, but then loads them down with restrictions. In 2017, Need for Speed Payback tried to address some of these wrongs. It included major quality of life fixes, such as an offline single player mode and a full day night cycle. And it had a change in story, taking inspiration from the latest movies in the Fast and Furious series. For all of that, it was met with an average open critic score of 60. Not exactly a resounding success. Need for Speed Payback commits a similar sin as its predecessor. It focuses too much on aesthetics and fails to deliver on mechanics. The high-octane story is full of chases and stunts, all of it in fast cars worth lots of money. But none of it feels good. And there's little room for the player to customize it to their liking. And being an EA game, it's riddled with microtransactions and surprise mechanics. There's surprise mechanics. Underneath all of the chrome is a driving game with lackluster handling and too many scripted moments. In the rush to cash in on the success of the Fast and the Furious movies, they forgot one thing. The Fast and the Furious series kinda sucks. It's automotive bling with a one-liner story and a pop-crap soundtrack, 
and none of that makes for a good video game. Judging by the trailers, developer interviews, and early player feedback, Need for Speed Heat looks to be more of the same. A style that personifies the worst parts of car culture, backed by gameplay that feels like an on-rails theme park ride. What they really need to do is get back to the basics, to that marriage of aesthetics and mechanics. Make a game that captures the style of parking lot car culture, and the feel of driving your own custom-built car. Because right now, Need for Speed is just another legacy series, being parted out for a few quick bucks. Oh, hello there. You've caught me practicing my reading. Boy, I sure wish I wasn't illiterate. Clearly you've enjoyed another Subpixel video. If you could like, comment, or subscribe, it lets us and it lets YouTube know that our content is worth watching. In the meantime, I'm going to get back to pretending.